where have you been? I've been somewhere that... You just disappeared for three weeks. <laughs> I know, and I didn't even take you with me. Yeah, that's hardly fair, but I'm living vicariously through you, so this is all about Antarctica. Yes, and I'm happy to tell you all about it. There's been a ton of interest out there because we told people you were going and you've posted a few pictures and a million people have asked us for some sort of idea of what you're up to and how you went, got there and all the stuff that you did. So we thought we'd put together this, this quick um, recording. So we'll talk about a few things. Uh, one is just some backgrounder stuff about going to Antarctica. There's three different ways to get to Antarctica. You went on an expedition ship and there's a couple of other ways that we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, we can talk about the logistics of getting down to the bottom of the world and back what it's like to actually make landfall in Antarctica, which you did uh, a number of times, what your daily routine kind of looked like and what the optional activities were. And of course, everybody wants to hear all about the uh, wildlife, specifically the penguins. Right. People think that uh, Antarctica equals penguins. I'm sure there's more to it than that. And um, then finally, I thought we would finish up by just sort of, for people that are considering a, a trip to Antarctica, what's the sort of hierarchy of questions that they would want to ask when considering a trip. So that's what I would like to do. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so let's talk uh, about Antarctica in general. So uh, we learned, we don't hear much about it other than it's the place where all the scientists hang out. Right, I think one thing that surprised me is how huge it is. If you put the US and Mexico together, it's actually bigger than that. Yeah, it would be, if it were a country, it's actually would be the second largest country in the world. Yeah. So it's bigger than Canada. Russia is the only place bigger than Antarctica. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and also the other thing that surprised me is how mountainous it is. Um, for some reason, I think just because of the way it looks on the map, um, it looks like it should be low and flat. And yeah. it's, <laughs> and it's, it's uh, very rugged with mountains falling you know, right into the water. Yeah. And didn't you tell me it's, it's, it's got a whole bunch of records as like the coldest place on Earth, but there's a bunch of other things that it is the most of. Yeah, right. So it's the coldest place. It is the driest place and also the highest place, not just place, but continent. Hmm. That's kind of interesting. And it's, it's, it's actually kind of cool too, in so far as it, it actually doesn't belong to any one country. And this is, uh, apparently they haven't discovered oil there yet because <laughs> none of us are fighting over it. There's all these international treaties about how we act and interact in Antarctica. Yeah, it is, it is actually pretty interesting. There's um, a number of countries that do have claims to Antarctica. They've you know, registered their claim that they believe that part of Antarctica belongs to them for various reasons. Yep. But yeah, uh, besides that, you know, um, they've, all these countries have come together and, and formed this treaty all for the purpose of protecting you know this last untouched place cool and i want to hear more about that maybe we can talk about that when you uh talk about what a landfall actually looked like but obviously antarctica doesn't have an international airport so we're not flying directly into antarctica and so there's some uh, logistics involved in actually getting there and and um, certainly from north america if you're flying out of the united states no matter where you're flying from uh, it's just an awful long way <laughs> way to antarctica so uh, depending on where you're flying from, uh, I, I looked up yesterday, they've actually got direct flights from Los Angeles for folks that live in the uh, Pacific time zone. But other than that, it's probably large airports only, it's Chicago, Atlanta, and so on. Um, and uh, a lot of these trips meet in Buenos Aires, which is where, uh, where you met the, the, the group. Right. And, um, you know, Buenos Aires is a huge international cosmopolitan city. So obviously there's flights from, from everywhere, including Europe. Mm -hmm. um, um, and yeah, certainly most of our clients are from North America, but there, there are other, other places in the world that are quite easily accessible to, um, to Antarctica as well, including um, New Zealand, for example. Of course, yeah. But, um, but Argentina is actually the closest. If you look, if you look at, the, at the globe upside down with Antarctica, you know, right in the middle, yep. you can see the tips of the other continents approaching it. And you can see there that the tip of South America is actually the, the closest. closest one. Yeah. 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 So your trip, actually, you met the group that you were traveling with uh, in Buenos Aires. And this is a uh, somewhat typical. Some of them um, uh, meet down at Ushuaia, 
but uh, a good portion of the Antarctic trips we've looked at, they actually do start in either uh, Santiago or, or Buenos Aires, right. which is a considerable distance from the southern tip of South America. Yeah, I don't think I fully appreciated that. Um, so as you know, I was traveling with Herta Gruden, and, yep. and their their trips generally start in Buenos Aires. Yep. And, and then, but then it is um, a three and a half hour flight from there to the tip of uh, you know, South America, Ushuaia, which is where you actually get on the ship. So yeah. yeah, three and a half hours is quite some distance. Yeah, I'm reminded of the people that go to Seattle and think that it's right next to uh, Alaska because they kind of think that that's that little corner and they're shocked when I tell them it's a four hour flight to Anchorage. <laughs> right. So same sort of deal here is you figure, okay, South America, I'm there, where in fact Buenos Aires, you've still got some distance to go. So yeah. most folks that end up in Antarctica will get to experience a little bit of, of South America, most uh, often Argentina as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so you make your way down to Ushuaia and I think you were only there for the day, if I remember. Yeah, we were there uh, just for part of a day and yep. then just the, the day of embarkation and then a bit of the day on the, of disembarkation, you know, after and before those uh, internal flights. Yeah, so Ushuaia, Terra del Fuego, the very southern tip of, uh, of, of South America. Is there much to it? I'm, I'm assuming it's not a... Well, it's spectacular, obviously, with the, um, the mountains and glaciers around it. You really do feel like you're at the end of the world. Cool. Um, but it's actually, uh, Ushuaia is a larger, um, city than I would have thought hmm. and um, honestly I can't remember how many people live there or whatnot but um, it, it's bigger than you would think. It, rem it reminds me of um, some of the cruise ports in, in Alaska actually like so for example maybe uh, Ketchikan or oh, cool. something like that. So yeah. there's stuff there to yeah. see. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so uh, you board the ship and this might be a good time to talk about the three different ways in which people end up in Antarctica. And, um, and the reason we specifically talk about uh, three different ways is you were specifically on an expedition ship, which means we'll be talking mostly about that. So we'll, we can talk about the Hurtigruten experience. The other way is just so everybody knows uh, is, you know, Holland America, Celebrity and occasionally Princess Cruises do run their smaller vessels um, down around the Cape Horn. And uh, they do they do call them Antarctic cruises, and they do do a drive by. In all fairness, uh, mm -hmm. but any ship with more than five is it five hundred people? Is, Correct. Yep. Yeah, is not allowed to actually make landfall in Antarctica. So right. if you really just want to go see it, get your binoculars out and say, "Oh, there it is." You can do that on Celebrity Holland America, and as I said, Princess Cruises does it on its um, World Cruise segments, I believe. Uh, so the second way is uh, an expedition ship, which is uh, the way that you went. So that would be lines like uh, Herta Gruden and uh, Lindblad National Geographic. Uh, there's a few others that do it. Oh no, yeah. Uh, and then the third way is maybe a bit of a hybrid between the two. It's on would be on a, a small ship. So this is, I'm thinking about lines like Seabourn and Silver Sea. Mm -hmm. And these are obviously higher and more luxury offerings than, than the one that you did. Right. Uh, but nevertheless, a, a good way to see it uh, as well. But we're going to be focused mostly on your experience on the Lindblad ship. And what was the name of the ship again? Uh, the Hurtigruden ship. And uh, the name of the ship was Midnight Soul. Midnight Soul. Which means Midnight Sun. Yeah. And uh, I looked this up because I like numbers. So it was a, um, it's 15,000 tons. Okay. Which um, makes it a small vessel. It's, it's yeah. uh, you know, I looked it up um, uh for people that live in and around um, uh, on coastal areas, uh, a lot of ferries are about that big. Car right. ferries are around that size, and it actually is used. That ship is used as a car ferry in Norway. Yeah, that's right. The ship um, part of the year it spends up in on the Norwegian coast, um, doing doing the traditional Hurtigruten run up and down the the Norwegian coast, and and on that run they stop at thirty four different cruise ports in a period of twelve days. Cool. And so. Uh, I mean, we can talk about that another time, but yeah, it, it is actually used as a ferry. Yeah, and so for people that like the numbers, uh, just to give you an idea, Seaborn and Silver Sea, their ships are around 30,000 tons. This one was about half that, 15, oh, interesting. 15 okay. 16,000 tons. Mm. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, had everything you needed on board. How many people were on board the ship? Well, the ship um, actually holds 550 people, Yes. but um, there were only 500 on board because for the for the purpose of going to Antarctica so that we would be allowed to do landings. Cool. And so people that follow us know that you and I are in the somewhat lucky position of getting to do a fair number of cruises because it's our job. Yeah. Uh, how does this compare to other ships that you've been on? 
Well, um, this was actually the first expedition ship I'd been on. Mm -hmm. So I, I was expecting it to be very basic and Spartan. And so I was kind of surprised when I got on board that it, it actually looked like a regular cruise ship. <laughs> So, um, yeah, very familiar looking yeah. um, with um, big, comfortable public areas, lots of big windows, um, bright places to sit if, if you're not outside. Um, you know, the dining rooms, the specialty dining room. Yeah, it felt very, very familiar. So I know people are going to ask about food and beverage. So how did that compare to other cruise lines that you've been on? Well, as I say, I was expecting, uh, rightly or wrongly, I was expecting something quite Spartan. So I was, I thought the food was a lot better than I expected it would be. With it was, all due respect to the Hurtigruten <laughs> folks, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it was, it was excellent. Um, the way they do it, because we're so active and the schedule changes every day, uh, the, the meals are actually planned around the expedition schedule so it the the dining schedule actually changes from day to day cool so some days it's more of a buffet style and other days it's a more leisurely um, seated dining type of arrangement and this is a Norwegian uh, cruise line so d was it pickled herring for breakfast lunch and dinner or was there a wide <laughs> variety of food you know what if you wanted pickled herring it, it was certainly available yeah um, but there was you know all kinds of cold breakfast stuff and all kinds of warm breakfast stuff like there was no end of um of choice of food it yep. was yeah and can i get a glass of wine on this boat <laughs> yes you can let's, let's get down to the most important things that are going to drive <laughs> people's decisions so yeah um actually when i um when i was on it um it, it, wine and all kinds of beverages were certainly available i from what i understand heard gruden starting next year on their expedition ships is going to be including beer and wine yes. with lunch and dinner. Um, but in my case, you just order by the glass and um, and also there's wine packages available at the beginning of the cruise. I didn't look into it, but yeah. some of the people we were traveling with did that. So it gets charged to your shipboard account just like any other cruise yep. ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what, uh, which is interesting, so what currency do they use on board? So again, you're charging things to your, your room. Well, yeah, interestingly, uh, the onboard currency is the Norwegian kroner. Ah. So um, it was a little confusing for me because I'd come from um, North America and then spent some time in Buenos Aires where they use pesos, the pesos yeah. and then and then had to change again to to the onboard currency so um, so this is really just a consideration in the way that you think and how yeah, things are priced exactly but we can use American credit cards to pay our shipboard account yep that's okay. right and um, and actually a little helpful tip is just to download one of those currency conversion apps onto your phone so cool. that when when you're on the in the gift shop or whatever you can just quickly type it in and figure out how much you're actually going to be spending okay how about uh, entertainment on the ships um, th the focus on the ship on this ship was more to do with enrichment so there was a lot of lectures and um, learning type activities entertainment there was nightly entertainment but um i wouldn't go on the cruise just for the entertainment sure. you know there was well that makes sense yeah. you're in you're in antarctica but uh, you know certainly they wouldn't have the big broadway shows like you're going to have on taking a cruise out of florida that's right, right. and um interestingly we've talked about going on silver sea or seaborne and those kind of they actually would have their normal entertainment lineup on board to antarctica right on an expedition ship it sounds like it was more uh, lectures and and seminars about Antarctica than it was about Broadway show tunes. Right. I mean, and the evening, there's still plenty to do. You can go up into the lounge and listen to, you know, m music and um, and connect with other people. But yeah, no shows or anything like that. Cool. Wi-Fi. How do I uh, upload all my pictures to Facebook? Well, these things are always changing. Um, Wi-Fi is available, um, but because in Antarctica, the satellite coverage is is not perfect down there. Yes. There's places where you go where where internet is either slow or not available for, you know, hours, certainly hours at a time. Sure. Um, and, and when it is available, it's 
It's, it's like dial-up used to be. It's slow, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think we forget how quickly Wi-Fi has changed on board cruise ships. Right. Uh, and what maybe people don't know is, is that a lot of times when cruise ships are close to shore, they actually leach up local cell right. signals. So it makes it, you know, when you're on a, uh, what is it, G3, G4? We got the right one? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, when you're leaching off those things, it's much faster as opposed to bouncing everything yeah. off a satellite. So it's undoubtedly slow and painful, no matter which line you go on. Yeah, and um, I mean, I, I found it that a bit frustrating, but on the other hand, it's kind of a good place to try to wean yourself connected. to not be connected, <laughs> right? Because the reason that you're there is to, to be one with nature. Yeah, yeah, makes perfect so sense. It's not the worst thing in the world. Okay, that's the ship. Let's talk about, uh, so you would have uh, left Ushuaia and then it's a couple of days before you make land, right? Is it two or three days uh, across the Drake yeah, Passage? Yeah, it's, uh, it's two, two and a half days, depending on, on the weather, I guess. So what was that like? I've heard about the Drake Passage. I've never, I've never even done a cruise around Cape Horn, so I've never done that part of the world. What's, what's, what's the Drake Passage like? <laughs> yeah, it's funny because, honestly, I didn't put a moment's thought into it until I got to Buenos Aires and met up with my group. And there were some people who were really, really worried about it, about hmm. the seasickness aspect of it. Yep. The Drake Passage has a reputation for being, you know, the wildest, you know, waters in the world. And, uh, but anyway, so I really didn't know what to expect. I had brought seasickness patches that you put behind your eye, your ears. Yes. And uh, that worked for me. But um, so the, what they talk about for the Drake Passage is, there's two type, two extremes of water conditions that you can experience. One is called the Drake, Drake Lake, which means that it would be lake-like conditions, yeah, nice, and flat. <laughs> nice sure. and flat. And then the other extreme is the Drake Shake. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm happy to report that I experienced both. So on the way there, we had Drake Lake yeah. for the most part. And then on the way back, it was the Drake Shake. The Drake Shake. So, what is that like? Is that uh, did did you find people getting seasick? And yeah, there were definitely people who um, I didn't see actually for a couple days. <laughs> um, the ship's doctor apparently is the busiest during that time. So, yes. um, I guess people come not prepared for the seasickness, or they don't expect to get seasick. Whatever. Yeah. Um, and and, and ex it, this didn't happen on our crossing, but. Um, the, the one before ours, the conditions were so extreme that uh, people were actually confined to their cabin and, and, and food was brought to the cabin instead of going to the dining room. Wow. But, uh, so I, don't, I honestly don't know how often that happens, but yeah, you definitely need to be prepared for, for some rough weather. Okay, yeah, so be a Boy Scout, always be prepared, be ready to go one way or the other. Yep. Okay, so you make it across the Drake Passage, apparently it's pretty easy to get there, and uh, you you sight Antarctica, there it is. Yeah. And I'm guessing it was, uh, it doesn't really get dark much at this time of year down there, so. No, uh, that's right. So just for the record, if somebody's listening to this later, you went at the end of November. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of just the beginning of the season down there. Right, just coming in, it'd be late fall, early yeah. summerish in the Southern Hemisphere. So um, tell me about the landing. So you obviously, again, there's not big jetties for the, for the cruise ships to berth up at. So you're anchored and then tendered ashore. Right, and so just to back up a bit, the, the, the landing places, the place where the ships go, they're actually reserved well ahead of time. I'm guessing at least a year. Oh, wow. You know, so, and that, that just ensures that, you know, there's not more than one ship there at one time. Yeah. And uh, also, you know, to make sure that <laughs> spreads the love around, I guess, a bit, because they, they really look at all these details to protect to protect the continent. Yep. But yeah, so um, so of course we're all super excited, <laughs> anticipating our landing, and you know we're looking out the 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 window for the first signs of icebergs and stuff like that. Yep. Um, but uh, you know on, on the w we we did have two days of crossing on the way there, and that time was all fully and well used preparing us for our landing because they don't just like you say they you, you can't just walk off right. Yeah. So there's all kinds of things that we had to do to prepare. So um, to start off with, they um, distributed our um, boots. Yep. That everyone has to wear these provided boots. Um, they're kind of like rubber boots with kind of thick uh, 
soles on them. So I can't bring my own Sorrells on this gig is what you're telling me. You know, I'm not sure if you can or not. I didn't see anybody bring their own boots, but yeah. th let's put it this way. There's absolutely no reason that you would bring your own boots. Oh, that makes packing easier. Right, so, yeah, that's <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, you have to get fitted for those. So, um, and you know, this is, they've done this a million times, so it's all totally organized. And then likewise, they provide you with, um, an outer shell jacket so it's waterproof windproof and then you you get it larger than you normally would with the idea that you would put a lot of layers underneath yeah so we get our clothing all organized um, and of course just like any other cruise there's a safety briefing yep or a mustard drill they call it on a cruise line sure so I think that's actually when the first time it really hit me where we were going was during the mustard drill because you know not only do they show you how to put on your um, life vest if you need to yeah. but there's everybody also has these orange survival suits that you have to get into so the, the crew does a big demonstration of that and and uh, I think that's when I realized okay you know, we're not in the Caribbean <laughs> right now. <laughs> You're not birthing up in Cozumel <laughs> right. and going to the jewelry yeah, store. Like, yeah. And and also thinking how much I really didn't want to end up in the water. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, yeah, and then there's also separately uh, um, whole sessions on tender boat safety. Yes. Uh, the tender boats are the, the zodiacs that we use to get back and forth to the land and yeah. for other, you know, cruising as well. But there's... Um, very specific ways that you have to get in and out of the boats and and ways to behave when you're in the boat and, and so on and and I'm telling you they take safety <laughs> very seriously yeah. on these ships um, you know where you're so far from any kind of assistance yes. that um, it's, it's absolutely the, the number one concern with everything that they do so um, other than basic safety and, you know, getting, oh yeah, and then also um, one way that they protect the environment um, from, from foreign species getting introduced yep. is all your outer clothing, whatever you're going to wear, um, you have to vacuum it <laughs> beforehand. So we, um, you know, we lined up and vacuumed all our clothing. Uh, just, just so I've never done this before. So you you have to vacuum your clothes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, just on the off chance that you know some little piece of moss that's stuck on your hat sure. might blow away and and introduce itself to this fragile environment. Hmm. So that's clothing, and then also um, w there's a mandatory. Uh, briefing that you have have to attend everybody has to attend or they literally will not let you do a landing yep. um, it and it's to introduce you to all these guidelines um, about how to how to behave when you're on the land so the biggest the biggest thing is that once you're on land the the animals are the they're the boss <laughs> so they we take the back seat to the animals because they they don't the animals are not they're curious they're not sure. afraid and um and like you could literally walk up and touch a penguin i'm sure hmm. so there's all kinds of very specific rules about what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do so no penguin hunting <laughs> and uh so yeah for example you have to stay five meters away from any which is about 15 feet away from any uh, wildlife. Yep. And, you know, basically if something approaches you closer to that than that, then just stand still and, and let it and maybe back away a bit. But, uh, you know, even selfie sticks, that counts. <laughs> you know, uh, okay. you can't stand five meters away and then reach in with a selfie stick. And so I'm not getting a selfie with a penguin, is what you're telling me. <laughs> so you were, you, they put you into a boat, they send you ashore. Who accompanies you ashore? So I know they've got an expedition team there, but what were these people like? And and you know, again, what I'm trying to get a feel for is is that okay, we've we see the continent now, we drop anchor. Yeah. Um, 
I assume it takes them a little while to get ready to get you all ashore, right? And so what does that look like? Do they pile, how many mm. do you get into a tender boat, for example? Right, so um, one of the things that we did on the, on, the cr on the way over while we're waiting to get there is they assigned us into tender boat groups. Yes. So, not so that stays with you through the cruise. You're on the same tender boat team, if you like. Yeah, the, okay. so it's not a specific boat, but it's like a group of boats. Sure. So uh, let's say I was in group boat number one. Sure. Boat group number one. And let's see, I guess you could probably fit maybe 15 people yeah. on a tender boat, maybe a bit more. Yeah. But um, so at every night they publish a schedule, like at the end of the day, they would publish a schedule telling you what time they're going to be doing the landings. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and so you have a, and it's rotated. So just because I'm boat group number one doesn't mean I'm gonna go first every day. Right. It's all always rotating around. And um, and so I have an approximate idea of what time I'm gonna be going, whether it's like one o'clock or nine o'clock or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, but then you wait, then when it gets close to your time, you start getting all your gear on in, in your room, including your um, your boots, your, your layers, your coat, um, and then a life jacket that everyone wears the whole yes. time. It's not inflated. It's one of those ones you have to pull a cord and it inflates uh, it. Okay. But um, so everybody, so it's not obtrusive at all. But so then when it's almost your time, everybody gathers in, you know, the lobby kind of area. Yep. And then when they call your name, then they, then you, your whole group walks down the stairs to the tender pit area, which is you know what the it's like the water level kind of where the ferry the the cars on the ferry would be yep and that's what one, one really good thing about this cruise line is that um the entry to the tender boats is right at water level so you um for people who i, I don't want to say have mobility issues but if you're worried if you if you're an older person and you and you can get around normally then you're not going to have it they'll make sure you get on this tender boat cool um, so it's not like stairs that are dangling off the side of the ship right. precariously like we see in other places. That's exactly right. Yeah. And there's people, I mean, you can see in the video, but there's people specially trained to help you get in and off the boat. And there's no end of people to help you do that. So the, and the, the expedition team, they're just so impressive. I think number one, it, how many of them there are on the ship. I think on, on our ship, there was maybe... 20 or 25 expedition team members wow yeah and they're all um they're all so knowledgeable and yeah. trained they're not th these are not you know cabin stewards who are <laughs> you know somebody doing their summer co-op yeah, yeah no no these are scientists and 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 specialists from all over the world cool yeah so it's very interesting but anyway so the when we get close to a landing site, the first people to go are the expedition team members. They go out there, they find the place, safest place to do a landing. Um, they they might like cut stairs into the ice to so that it's easier for people to get out. Sure. They look around to see if there's any dangers. They look around to see where the wildlife is right now because it might be different than last time they were there. Yep. They um, they they set out t trails because you have to, when you're there you have to walk on these certain trails and you're not allowed to go anywhere else. So they mark them with um, poles and cones that you can follow. Also, I can't just it's not like Cozumel again, right? I can't just wander around from souvenir shop to souvenir shop on my own. Yeah, you know, there's there's a fair bit of flexibility there, there were many times where I felt like I was alone out there it's not it's not that you're walking around in a line but yeah yes. there's definitely there's boundaries boundaries that's yeah. a good word yeah before I forget to ask how because we're talking about putting all this gear on and going over to the bottom of the world the icy continent how how warm or cold I guess was it when you were there um it was surprisingly surprisingly warm to me i was expecting it to be much colder yeah so there is ice and whatnot around obviously that stays there all the time but it was hovering around the freezing mark cool so usually just below but 
sometimes just above. So, yeah. you know, it, it's not the, the deep freeze that you might be expecting. So having said that, the wind, it's very, it's like the windiest place on earth too. So, um, and when the wind comes up and it's a little bit chilly and there's some pre precipitation, it can get mighty chilly. So yeah. the, you know, dressing in layers is the whole key. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes a whole pile of sense. So, so you, you're out, you're running around on the continent uh, and it's time. How long would you stay before you headed back to the ship? Usually, um, well, when we uh, when you get off um, of your tender, then there's a mini little briefing right there on shore. Yes. And they, you know, kind of point and tell you where the interesting things are and you know where not to go. Yep. And then they and then they tell you, okay, you have to be back by uh, whatever time. And yeah. typically it was about an hour and a half. Okay. So quite a lot a lot of time. And uh, the reason for this is because. In addition to that limit of 500 passengers on the ship, yes. they're only allowed to have 100 on land at a time. So they've got to cycle everybody through. Right. And, and the other thing we should mention too is is that not a whole lot of public restrooms on, in Antarctica. True. I never thought about that. <laughs> well, just meaning that if they allowed you to be out there for five or six or seven oh, hours, because yeah. they do ask you, you know, the women are fine with this, but sorry guys, I got to say, right? Like, you know. Guys are known to, if you got to go, you got to go, right? <laughs> so the women are far more polite. But um, that doesn't happen in Antarctica. You're specifically forbidden from doing that. Uh, yeah, that's right. And actually, even this really freaked out the people who chose the overnight camping um, I want to talk about that next. Yeah, okay, we'll talk on. about that next. Yeah. But, uh, so it's an optional thing that you have to pay extra for if you want to do it. But um, yeah, there's no... Um, you're best to hold it if you if you are camping, and they do have potties there. Oh, okay. But camp potties, yeah. Yeah, but it's it's literally a little potty in the like down the trail away from the camp. Like there's no privacy. You're gonna have penguins watching you do your biz. Yeah. Yeah. So most people just tried to hold it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you're ashore for an hour, hour and a half, uh, whatever, two hours, whatever it may be in the daytime. Then you've got to go back to the ship to uh, make way for the next group of folks to go ashore. So, so how does that work? You tender back to the ship? Yeah, um, and just one other thing about the landing that I should mention is um, this is the more to do with the safety part of it. Yes. But they, so they provide hiking poles, so um, they're all over there waiting for you. But also the team has the expedition team always set at every landing site sets um, a little supply of gear that would like water food shelter enough that would keep those hundred people you know alive alive well more than alive <laughs> alive and comfortable for 24 hours oh in case so, you get stuck yeah in case oh, you get okay. stuck because you're you're um you know, you're relying on these tenders to get back and forth and the weather changes super quickly there. Hmm. So, um, and so we, of course, wanted to know, have you ever had to use this stuff? Yes. And they um, said in the time that Hurtigrun has been going down to Antarctica, which is quite a long time now, but they've only had to ever use it once and it was for a period of seven hours. A, a group oh, okay. got stranded for seven hours. So. so scary, but good to know they have contingency exactly. plans. Exactly. Yeah. Right on. So you head back to the boat. Yeah, head yeah. back to the boat. And then um, it's, you know, you reverse the procedure of getting on. Somebody's there to um, hold your arm when you step up and whatnot. Um, you have to go through this special boot wash machine. So it's one, if it's uh, just same thing to make sure that you're not moving biomass around yes. the place, I guess. So you get off, you walk through this machine that has like rolling brushes with a little boot car wash. Water. Yeah, like a boot car wash. You cool. go th and and then after that you have to stomp on um it's like um a thick sponge that's soaked in liquid and that hmm. somehow disinfects your boots as so well. So this is the decontam unit. We've seen this in science fiction movies. Have you? Okay, there you go. <laughs> and then and then they scan your um what's it called? Your you know, like your cruise card. Yes. So you, they scan you on the way out, so they always know who's out and who's in, and then they scan you on the way back in. Cool. And that's making a landfall. That's making it. Yeah. Okay. 
So um, you mentioned earlier about doing the camping in uh, uh, in Antarctica. So t to be clear, so you were actually on the continent for I think eight days, six or eight days. Um, yeah, about yeah, about a week. That's okay. right. Yeah. So you made landfall every day. You got to walk around on the continent every day. Pretty much. Yeah, we did seven landings. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which uh, which again we should point out is is actually not guaranteed. These are all weather dependent. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, being an expedition ship. Yes. Um, that's one of the big differences from a regular cruise ship. Although I guess the cru regular cruises do have the ability to monitor, like change their itinerary you know, as necessary, but yeah. but on an expedition ship, it is literally day to day. Yeah, like an hour to hour. Yeah, yeah, an hour to hour. So we, the like at eight o'clock at night, we would find out um, what plan A is <laughs> for yeah. the next day. Yeah. And then even then the understanding is, you know, we'll see how it goes. We, hope. we might have to go to plan B or C. Right. Right. Okay. So uh, you get to go around and walk around every every day, and then there's some optional things you can also do down there. So you mentioned the overnight camping for those that want, are <laughs> ready to put up with a little bit of cold and, and yeah. not being able to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. And uh, But you get bragging rights for having slept on the continent of Antarctica. Yeah. So that's good. What else, or what are the other optional activities, if you like, uh, that uh, people can do when they're on one of these uh, expedition cruises to Antarctica? Um, well, in addition to the landings that are included on this cruise line, yep. um, there's also what they call ice cruising. So usually every day there was a landing that you could do and then also ice cruising. Yep. So ice cruising is in the Zodiac and then, um, but you don't go to shore, you just cruise in and out of the icebergs, which are spectacular so cool. that's that's all included yeah. but then if you wanted to pay extra there's some optional excursions so like the camping the other one was snowshoe hiking yep um, which was very popular and also um, kayaking which is something that uh, that I took part in that'd be good fun and it was and then um, what else Oh, oh yeah, there was also a really popular photography program. Yeah. It was quite intensive. They, um, you know, in addition to classes and whatnot on board, they um, had special excursions where they would go off the ship and, and, um, and you know, practice. So this would have been run by a professional photographer. Mm -hmm. that, cool. Yeah. They had at least two or three professional photographers on board and they were excellent. Yeah. Awesome. So everybody wants to know when they go to Antarctica, am I going to see penguins? <laughs> so and and so I don't want to talk just about penguins, of course. I but do. Let's, I let's love start, the penguins. Let's start with the penguins. So <laughs> so you go ashore and there's penguins there. Oh, and for me, they were the main attraction. They honestly, they are the cutest, most mesmerizing thing. How I, big are they? Because we think of them as being little tiny, like cat-sized critters. Yeah, they're no, they're the ones. There's all these different, um, you know, species, but yes. the, the ones that we saw, anyways, were probably, I don't know, three feet tall. Wow, they're pretty big. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, normally, normally they um, live in the water, actually. So all year they're swimming around. They go thousands of miles. We saw um, images of they put trackers on them, some yes. of them, and you can see maps of how far they go. And it's the only reason they're on land is because we visit Antarctica in in the the breeding season, so they're yes. mating and laying their eggs. But but normally, so they're on land. They're not actually that mobile. They got these tiny little stubby legs. Yeah. And um, but in the water, they're just they're amazingly like graceful yeah. and and fast. Yeah. Yeah. So it was mating season. Did you uh, get to see any <laughs> penguins on the job? Or uh? yes, we did. <laughs> um, I had to ask. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it, so that's something to consider when you're going to Antarctica is figuring out what season you want to go because yeah. so early in the season when we were there. So just for clarification, early in the season would be like November, November, end of November, December, and then late maybe. in the season would be like mid-March. It's March. not a real long season. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so early in the season, uh, it's known to be pristine, you know, the white snow. Uh, and ice, um, the penguins are mating. Um, if you want to go more in the middle of the season, that's when you'll see the penguin chicks. 
which okay, would so be January ish. Yeah, yeah or, okay. Yeah, January, February. Yeah. And then and then later in the season, um you're apparently more likely to see whales and um and sea lions. Like we saw some of those but not super numerous. Yeah. Um and and uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that the, the penguins, because they're in these colonies, they uh, actually smell quite a bit. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> so Ever we, been to a farm? Yeah, so yeah. We, we didn't actually notice it too much, but apparently as the season goes on, it, can, it, it gets worse and worse, or you know, stronger and stronger. So yeah. there's definitely pros and cons, but I, I sure loved being there early in the season, because it, Whenever we went to a landing site, there was not even a footprint there. I felt like it was the first time anyone had been there. Yeah. Well, in a place as big as Antarctica, you n you just never know. Yeah, right? you never so know. You're talking yeah. about a massive, massive, uh, a massive place. So. Yeah, and, and just to give you an idea, like I think we saw the whole time we were there, I think we might have seen two other ships. Like in the distance, like they weren't way off in the distance. Right, so they weren't birthed up next to you. No, like, no, no. Like again, when you you know, yeah. stop in at Ocho's Rios. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay, yeah. so we uh, we saw penguins. What else did you get to see while you were there? Well, penguins never get old. Just so you know. <laughs> so we saw penguins on land. Yeah. Two like two main types of penguins, and that, but then it's also fascinating watching them in the water because of the way they swim, they they swim kind of like dolphins. So they, uh, you know, they're just so cute. But anyway, so yeah, so we saw we saw lots of penguins. Other than that, we we did see some whales. Cool. Um, two different kinds of whales, but I wouldn't I wouldn't say they were super numerous and. Likewise, we saw some seals yeah. uh, lying on the ice, which is really cool. But um, only like a couple of those, so yeah. I it, I think it was just the wrong time of year for those for us. Cool. And other than that, if you're a bird watcher, this would be a fantastic trip for you too. There's just like hundreds of different kinds of seabirds. Cool. So I got to think on a trip like this. So you fly from North America in our winter months down to, uh, uh, in your case, you went to Buenos Aires, which is uh, quite tropical. I think it's about mm -hmm. the same uh, latitude as, as San Diego or Miami. Uh, and, uh, and then you're going to Antarctica. So assuming you don't take a Mrs. Howell sized trunk with you, <laughs> how do you pack for this trip? What are the, what are the and, and did you see any particular packing misses? And maybe not from you, but from other travelers. Are, are there, did you overhear people say, oh, geez, I wish I'd brought this? Yeah, it was um, it was quite a, a difficult trip to pack for actually because because of the dual nature of the climate. So, right. um, so I needed shorts and sandals for Buenos Aires, but I needed w long underwear <laughs> and mittens and hats for for Antarctica. Right. Um, and of course, all those things are you know take up room, but. So the most important packing things I, I mean, I'm used to this just because of the, the West Coast climate that we live in, yes. but is, is packing, is uh, dressing in layers. So um, the, the biggest miss I saw was one poor man walking around in his jeans. You definitely don't want jeans uh, that can soak up moisture and, and uh, don't keep you very warm. Right. Um, so instead, you want to make sure that you bring waterproof outer layer of pants so yeah. and then under that basically all you really need to wear is like a thermal layer like a long underwear layer sure, base layer yeah, base you bet. layer yeah. yeah so base layer with um uh, waterproof pants and then they provide the boots so you don't need to bring any of those although i did some people see some people bringing them so make sure you read all your pre-cruise material about right. about all that kind nothing of stuff. like dragging a heavy pair of boots across the world when you don't have to definitely and, and more than one person did that wow. um and then they provide the coat and I, I i brought my own coat but honestly i should have left it at home uh, um okay yeah so bec uh so all you really need is you know some light thin layers yes. like um thin sh shirts and then some kind of fleecy type jacket that or not jacket but like a sweater that would go over that insulation a, yeah. as a middle layer yeah 
Um, the one thing I, w a couple things I wish I would have brought is, um, you know, one of those neck gaiters. Yes. Um, they're really handy. N not that it's like when you're on the ski lift, you can just pull it up over your nose, and it when you're on the zodiacs, if you, if the wind comes up, it's it's handy. And then the other thing I wish I would have brought is my ski goggles. <laughs> ski goggles. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I guess yeah, because the sun never goes down there. Right, so on a sunny day, you're getting, getting, you know, bombarded with sun rays at ten thirty at night. And uh, yeah, with the and blowing, the, wind? the yeah. wind and the um, snowflakes blowing around, um, and it, at the very least, I should have brought um, a strap for my sunglasses because uh, I didn't, okay. I didn't have um, a ski goggles, but I was jealous of the people who did. <laughs> yeah. So what about, I'm, I'm thinking about things and it just occurred to me that in South America they use a different current, right? And, and certainly mm -hmm. the ships from Norway, they use a different electrical current than we do uh, in the United States as well. So what, uh, like do you need to take a converter? Like how do you, like, how do you charge your iPhone? Yeah, um, iPhones, I didn't know until I started looking into it for this trip, but iPhones, you don't need any kind of um, converter. What you do need is an adapter. Ah, uh, okay. Um, so, so the difference, of course, being an adapter is just something that you... Like physically changes, um, you know... A, the plug-in. The plug, right. yeah. You don't need to change the current or yeah, anything. Yeah, the voltage or the amperage or whatever the ding-dang it is. But, you know, for other things you want to bring, like your hairdryer, your Kindle, those kind of things, you do need... I brought a converter and I used it all the time. Cool. Um, the other thing I really wish I would have brought is a better camera. Ah, okay. So I um, I use my iPhone all the time to take photos. Yeah. And I, I'm always under the impression that it takes pretty darn good photos and videos. Well, it probably does for a phone. Yeah, and um, it was just really frustrating down there. Uh, it didn't have the zoom capability that, that yes. you really want. Um, and also, maybe I don't know how to use the iPhone camera very well, but just, for example, the ability to focus on something that's not in the center yes. of the field just those kind of things um also just um mine was fine actually but maybe just because the way i carried it but iphone batteries die really quickly in the cold uh, so okay. if you're carrying it around make sure you keep it close to you in the yes. cold um but yeah i wish i would have brought a better camera but still i got i still did get four thousand at least penguin photos right <laughs> so. well and, and two or three of other things as well. <laughs> uh, and interestingly, there was a photographer you mentioned on the ship. Yep. And uh, you were able to get her photos when... Uh, yep. They, at the end, um, they produced, they put on a slideshow for everyone to see, yep. which was incredible. I and bet. then um, you could purchase all their professional photos on a USB, uh, USB drive. And also, I mean, the other, if you have any interest in photography at all, and had a better camera than I did. <laughs> yeah. The photographers on board were quite happy to, you know, show you how to set, change the settings on your camera so that you could, you know, have it set up the best you possibly could to cool. capture photos. So I know a lot of people did that, and some people I travel with who were just, you know, casual photographers, they came away with some amazing photos. Yeah. How about binoculars? Are there binoculars in the room, or do I need to take my own binoculars? You know, I did bring binoculars and I even carried them with me in my little backpack sometimes. Yes. But you're so busy taking photos. Yeah. That um, I, one of the people that I was with, um, she recommended basically that you don't bother bringing binoculars because you're, you're so busy trying to take mm -hmm. photos and you're close enough to everything anyways. Cool. Good to know. I mean, it, they're so small, it can never hurt to bring them, I suppose, but I never used mine once. Yeah, yeah, and uh, also uh, for the Drake, you got to have motion, uh, motion sickness uh, yep, I remedies. Know, um, uh, some people had the patch like I did, and I noticed a lot of other people used the, um, the, uh, the, the wristbands, the, like yeah. the acupuncture wristbands, that mm -hmm. um, they say those work really well. But yeah, I have, you know, I don't know. You want to talk to your doctor about that, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you have it. The official packing list. Yep. Okay, I want to shift gears a little bit for people that might be thinking about 
doing a trip like this. So they're trying to figure out, uh, so this is all great stuff and I want to go see penguins and I'm ready to do the landings and it yep. sounds really appealing. But now I got to pick a, a line and a ship to go on. So again, what we've been talking about is your experience on Hurtigruden. Yeah. Um, and again, a, a lot of people may not have heard of Hurtigruten because they've been mostly focused in, in Europe for the last million years. They're actually over 100 years old. Yeah, they, they've act, Hurtigruten has been in operation since for 125 years. Yeah, and so they do all kinds of work in Norway. So for folks that, uh, they're a Norwegian company, and for folks that want to do, uh, they first came on my radar a few years ago when they um, did the guarantee to see the Northern Lights. Now that's, right. in, that's in Norway, not right. obviously in Antarctica, but, um, and um, they will be going to Alaska soon too. So that's kind of uh, interesting with, with Hurtigruden. and they're, they're very much focused on the polar regions. Right. Um, and as uh, we briefly mentioned, we're not going to run through all the options here, but as we briefly mentioned, there are other ways to get to Antarctica. So I just want to talk briefly about, well, how do people make the best decision for them, right? Because your experience on Hurtigruten was great. It worked really well for you. For other people, they may have different requirements. So mm -hmm. what, are the, what are the hierarchy of questions that we think people should be asking to try to help figure out what the best option for them is to go to Antarctica? Mm, that's a good question. I think um, the most important thing to start with would be what kind of experience do they want to have? Right. So are they happy with the drive-by? So that's right. And I should mention too, the drive-bys are cheap comparatively, yeah, right? right? So yeah, if you end up on a haul in America or, or uh, a celebrity ship, your costs per day are about the same as they would be everywhere else in the world, with the exception of the Caribbean. So which is way cheaper, yeah. but uh, on on every axis. But um, so if you just if you just want to get in the region and take some nice pictures of Antarctica, then that's a really cost-effective way to do it. Yeah, I, so I think the main thing is to, just to be aware of your options, because the worst case scenario yes. is that you're on one of those larger ships that's not doing landings, and you look off and you see people walking around. With the penguins. With the penguins, <laughs> and, and you think, oh, wait a second, that's really what I wanted to be doing. Right. So, you, yeah, you really need to be aware that, uh, of your different options, for right. sure. Right, and then uh, the other thing that occurred to me, I was doing some research the other day for one of our clients that had, had a real interest in going to Antarctica, and some of these trips are 10 days long, and others are 21 days long, and, and some of them include bits of South America, and, and yep. uh, which, which again is great, but it's actually hard to make an apples to apples comparison. So this particular client phoned up and said, well, why is this much this one twice as much as this one, mm -hmm. right? And, and okay, well, one's an expedition ship, one's a luxury ship, one's 21 days long and one's 10 days long. So it, it, right. it shouldn't be surprising that one's twice as much as the other. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess that's the other, th well, I mean, we don't, uh, we don't run into this a lot with our clients, but if, if you're somebody who really needs the luxury experience, yes, then that will also narrow down your choices. Yes. Her, her, Hurtigruden was fantastic. Yeah. Um, but it's not a luxury line and they don't want to be a luxury line. Right. Right. So. Um, yeah. So for those folks, we may, we may, may want to push them to Silver Sea that does have uh, expedition ships and yep. the Seabourn that has their Ventures by Seabourn program. Right. Uh, then they go to Antarctica. Um, and interestingly, uh, I looked up that the other day. Um, uh, they're not on Antarctica as long as the expedition ships, but you do right. get to make a landing every day that's included in your fare, right? So yeah. I, I did take a look at that itinerary, and um, yeah, it, it is pretty good. Um, and, and I guess that's one of the other questions you need to ask yourself is how much time do you have? Yes. Because um, it, it like because it takes two and a half days to get there minimum, and yeah. two and a, that's just to Ushuaia, not. Um, Buenos Aires, and then it two and a half days to come back. It, it's a long trip already. So um, not to not sorry to interrupt. Not to mention that it's logistically from anywhere in the United States, it's a day to get down and a day to get home. That's right. right? It's a minimum yeah. 10, 11 hour flight. Yeah. And by the time you do that, luckily the jet lag's not too bad. No, I mean, it's, it's two not. hours ahead of our Eastern time that's zone. That's right. Yeah. Um, so that's not bad, but you're gonna. It's a whole day to get down, a whole day to get back, and that's yeah. only to Buenos Aires or Santiago, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have to go to Ushuaia, then two and a half days over to it. You're yeah. not doing this in one week. No, that's right, and um, so that's something to consider. And then, I mean, so the minimum kind of trip 
with her to Gruden would be a 12 day trip, which is what I did. Right. That includes, you know, a round trip from Buenos Aires, but there's also longer trips, a 23 day trip, for example, where you actually go south of the Antarctic Circle. Cool. Um, and that, that the season for those trips is much shorter because the ice, like for example, when we were there, the ice wouldn't have been broken up enough for us to go that far south. Right. But, um, but yeah, the, the longer you have, the more you'll be able to see as well. Right, and you should decide too, is, is it okay, is this, a, is this a, a trip for to go to Antarctica? Or because I'm making the huge investment in time and, and uh, money to get to South America, do I want to also visit Argentina, Chile, right. Uruguay, Brazil, whatever you, uh, you, you choose to do, are you going to want to be seeing all these things? Or is it really just about getting to Antarctica? Right, and it's like anywhere else you travel, you know, you get down there and there's a million thing, other things that you could have done, right? Yeah. Uh, so I did, as, as you know, spend extra days in Buenos Aires, um, and I'm super glad I did. Yes. And then, you know, it, it just goes from there. It, it, there's Tierra del Fuego is accessible from Ushuaia, and I, I didn't do that at all. So, yeah. And I mean, I was going three weeks round trip, yes. right? So there's just so much to do down there. It's like everything else, only yep. one lifetime to see all these things. Yeah, so true. Okay, so um, I would suggest then that the, for people paying attention that the questions you should be asking if you're trying to make the right choice for you for Antarctica is first, which one of those types of cruises do you want to do? There are three, right? So do I want to go mass market, do a drive-by, cheap, mm -hmm. and tick in the box? Do I want to do, um, do I want the full luxury experience where I'm going to have the, you know, the, the first class food and entertainment on board the ship? Uh, or do I want an expedition experience? And so uh, bat that one around for a little while. Second one would be is, is that how long do you want your trip to be? And again, um, do you again just want to go see Antarctica or, or you want to encompass some of the, the South American stuff? From there, you can begin to take a look at what the cost of these various things are. And then, of course, you can spend a little or a lot on, on these trips. And again, a little is all relative because of the, the amount of time that you're away. But... Um, you know, again, I already mentioned that if you want to do the drive-by, this is your Holland America celebrity uh, version of Antarctica, that you can do that quite cost-effectively. Uh, the other end, if you're going on one of the luxury ships, um, you know, you're probably over 500 bucks a day on those uh, those particular ones. Yeah, certainly. And I just want to point out that I think there's quite a bit of overlap between uh, the luxury segment that you're talking about and the expedition. Yes. It, uh, because it's becoming so much more popular now, um, there's definitely luxury ships that are expedition ships. So um, Silver Sea would be the best example and probably yeah. Panon as well. Panon, that's right. I forgot yeah. about uh, that. They're down there as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's something for everybody. Yep. Yeah, there's, there's a million different ways to get there. Um, and again, you know, rough back of the napkin uh, calculation for a lot of expedition ships were probably, you're not getting on this ship for a hundred bucks a day, but, um, you know, it could be four to six hundred dollars a day. So it's, it's uh, depending on the decisions that are made. Yeah. And I'm guessing that would be a starting price. Yeah. Right. So the, the cabin that I had was, um, had a window, but not a balcony. Right. And that, and actually, um, I think there's inside cabins even. So, yeah. so yeah, yeah. I want to make sure people understand that's a price from. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's always the caveat yeah. when you're yeah. pricing out anything in the travel sector. Okay, so we've covered an awful lot of ground. If there's uh, questions that people have that maybe we haven't covered, what's the best way for them to get in touch with us uh, and, and we can put them on the phone with you or me and we'll try to help them uh, answer their questions? Um, well, you can always call us toll-free at 1-800-876-0168 or an online contact on our uh, website, yep. or you can just email me directly at sue at pamperedcruiser.com. I'm going to put all this on the video anyway. So Okay, sounds cool. good. Well, that was outstanding. I uh, am remarkably jealous that I didn't get to go, but uh, it's <laughs> Don't fun worry. to live vicariously through you. Yeah, and we'll have to go back and uh, check out a different cruise line. We will have to do that again.